Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Pursuant to House Resolution 8, today the committee is meeting virtually. I want to announce a couple reminders to the members about the conduct of this remote hearing. First, members should keep their video feed on as long as they are present in the hearing. Members are responsible for their own microphones. Please also keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. Finally, if members have documents they wish to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the hearing. Good morning. Welcome to today's Environment Subcommittee hearing to discuss the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration's Earth System Science and Stewardship Policies. I'd like to thank Ranking Member Bice for her bipartisan partnership at this hearing, as well as on recent legislation we've partnered together on, including the NOAA Weather Radio Modernization Act, which would expand and modernize a key tool in providing warnings on impending weather emergencies, as well as the VET Rent Act, which we'll be introducing soon to ensure veterans who were housed in barracks style housing have parity when competing for rental housing as civilians. I'd also like to welcome NOAA Administrator Dr. Richard Spinrad to the committee and thank him for being here to testify about the vital work of this agency. The climate crisis and its very real impacts they were facing today underscores the importance of NOAA's mission to understand and predict changes in climate, weather, and oceans and coast, to share that knowledge and information with others, and to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystems and resources. Extreme weather events and billion dollar disasters are on the rise, and NOAA's environmental research, services, and stewardship activities are critical to saving lives and safeguarding our economy. Earlier this month, Hurricane Ida, which made landfall over a thousand miles away, caused historic and deadly levels of rainfall and flooding across my district and region in New Jersey. New Jerseyans are unfortunately no strangers to flooding, but an event of this magnitude shows us why we need to invest in resilience and not just recovery. Climate change is causing storms like Ida to rapidly intensify and suck up more moisture, increasing flood risk. Supporting the work of NOAA's dedicated researchers and forecasters will help improve lead times for extreme weather and evacuation alerts and to better understand how climate change impacts extreme events like Ida. Many Americans utilize NOAA's data, products, and services on a daily basis, often without even realizing it. The most obvious examples are the weather apps on our phones. In addition, brave firefighters rely on meteorological data to predict where the latest catastrophic inferno will spread. Farmers across the country use products like the U.S. Drought Monitor to be strategic about their irrigation and crop decisions. Local officials utilize NOAA's real-time ocean data to know when to issue a harmful algal bloom warning in closed beaches. NOAA's Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments Program provide crucial climate products and tools for officials to make informed infrastructure and planning decisions that will withstand a changing climate and so much more. NOAA is only able to provide this and many more types of useful information because of its extensive network of Earth systems observations. These observational systems collect data from ships, aircraft, satellites, radar, and more. NOAA scientists then process and analyze the data to provide forecasts and predictions in an accessible manner for all of us to benefit from. That is why my colleagues and I on the Science Committee must continue to support NOAA's work. That means understanding what the agency needs to expand their current science and stewardship activities for future needs. It means providing the necessary high performance computing capabilities to both conduct research and run Earth systems models. It also means supporting NOAA's workforce by increasing both hiring and diversity. And last, but most certainly not least, it means upholding scientific integrity. NOAA and the scientific enterprise overall took a beating over the last several years when it came to upholding scientific integrity. We must work collectively to restore America's faith in science and our invaluable federal scientists. I'm pleased that by the Biden administration and Congress have taken steps to provide major investments for NOAA in fiscal year 2022 and beyond. Passing these investments into law will be critical to advancing the agency's life-saving work and to help Americans across the country. I'm looking forward to hearing Administrator Spinrad's vision for advancing cutting edge science and how we in Congress can support the agency's mission in tackling the challenges we face today and will face in the future. The chair now recognizes Ranking Member Bice for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Cheryl, for holding this hearing today. I also want to welcome Administrator Spinrad and thank him for his time today. Although we've had some great acting 
NOAA administrators. It's been a few years since we've had a confirmed administrator. So I want to congratulate you, Dr. Spinrad, and I look forward to working together. Last year, there were 22 weather, water, and climate disasters in the United States that exceeded $1 billion in losses. Communities around the country have struggled through the effects of extreme events, including hurricanes, floods, droughts, wildfires, and the collapse of fisheries. And no one knows the lasting consequences of severe weather better than my constituents in Oklahoma, the very heart of Tornado Alley. Violent tornadoes, as well as hailstorms and large thunderstorms, can pop up quickly, leaving just minutes for people to find safety. While natural disasters can be devastating and life-altering, the data, tools, and services NOAA provides can equip all Americans with better access to more timely warnings and support. The never-ending goal is to protect all lives and property. While weather forecasting and observations might be the most widely known output, NOAA has a wide-ranging mission, from fishery management to atmospheric observation. These products and services have a tremendous economic impact and affect more than one-third of America's gross domestic product. The President's fiscal year 22 budget request for NOAA was $6.98 billion, a 22% increase from last year's enacted funding. With such a large increase proposed, I look forward to hearing from Administrator Spinrad on what his priorities are for the agency. While I am certainly not opposed to investing in NOAA's life-saving products, we must ensure that the administration is adequately preparing, prepared to handle an increased budget. This includes expedited hiring, upgrading infrastructure, ramping up new research projects, and a variety of other issues. A lump sum of money with no strings attached can be a curse before it is a blessing. Therefore, priorities must be set and decisions must be made. When it comes to the specifics of the budget request, I was disappointed to see it did not include any details regarding the Earth Prediction Innovation Center, or EPIC. This committee has had multiple hearings on EPIC, and its timely implementation has been a priority for members on both sides of the aisle. It's a project that is absolutely critical to reclaiming and maintaining international leadership in numerical weather prediction. However, I was pleased to see NOAA's focus on increasing their higher performance computing capabilities. Last year, one of NOAA's systems, HERA, was ranked number 88 on the top 500 list of fastest supercomputers in the world. A continued emphasis on computing will accelerate the development of weather modeling across NOAA and the National Weather Service. This, in turn, will improve the prediction of high-impact weather events and evaluate the potential future directions for models and data assimilation. I hope to hear more on how NOAA can collaborate with other agencies, including the Department of Energy, which houses three of the top five fastest supercomputers in the world. Cross-agency collaboration, especially with an agency that is a, the clear subject matter expert, is the most efficient use of taxpayer money, and we should encourage it as much as possible. Lastly, I look forward to discussing how NOAA will leverage existing centers and scientific expertise to inspire and support the next generation of STEM students. Oklahoma is proud to house a key component of NOAA's infrastructure, the National Weather Center. The work conducted in this center provides property and life-saving services for the entire country. But in order to attract and keep the next generation of talent filling that center, we must ensure that our buildings, instruments, and the entire infrastructure are world-class. The meteorologists, oceanographers, biologists, and other researchers shouldn't have to settle for outdated buildings or cramped laboratories. Every member of this committee has priorities for their district, and I'm sure Administrator Spinrad has priorities of his own. I am excited to hear how NOAA plans to balance these and how we in Congress can help maximize our return on investment. And again, I want to thank Administrator Spinrad for testifying before the committee today, and I look forward to engage the engaging discussion. Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. And we're pleased to have the full committee chairwoman, Ms. Johnson, with us today. The chair now recognizes the chairwoman for an opening statement. Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, I'd like to give a warm welcome to our witness, 
our new administrator, Dr. Richard Spinner. Uh, he is testifying before the committee today for the first time since he officially took the helm of the agency. The National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration plays a critical role in protecting American lives, property, and economic prosperity. NOAA is a unique agency that performs cutting edge science, but also provides critical environmental service and stewardship. By looking at the earth as a system, we are better able to understand how the weather, ocean, climate, and atmosphere interact. Based on that understanding, NOAA provides essential services and products that serve us all. Recently, Americans have experienced an unprecedented string of natural disasters made worse by climate change. We've seen extreme heat and drought conditions out west that set the stage for this record-breaking wildfire season. And last month, Hurricane Ida rapidly intensified in the Gulf of Mexico before making landfall due to warmer water temperatures. In addition, warmer atmospheric conditions brought heavy precipitation leading to extraordinary flooding along the Gulf Coast and all the way up to New England. This one devastating storm killed dozens and left countless others uh, with property destroyed. Each year seems to have more multi-billion dollar weather and climate disasters than the previous. NOAA scientific observations, predictions, and warnings have always been vital to Americans across the country but they are becoming increasingly important for helping Americans prepare for extreme events exacerbated by climate change. This committee is steadfast in supporting NOAA as the authoritative source for weather and climate information. So I am glad that Chairwoman Cheryl spoke to the importance of this in her remarks. This committee has worked in a bipartisan fashion to authorize R&D activities that help reduce our emissions and mitigate climate change. NOAA's weather and climate programs also play an important role in addressing the climate crisis. NOAA data can be used to inform ad adaptation and resilience decisions at a community level. NOAA scientists contribute to major climate reports that influence policy around the world, including national climate assessments and IPCC assessments reports. It is reassuring to see that the president has elevated the importance of NOAA within his administration. We have the first Senate confirmed administrator in over four years, who is also eminently qualified. The administration has significantly increased its budget requests for NOAA. NOAA also has a seat on the multiple White House level interagency working groups tackling our most pressing climate issues. I look forward to this hearing from my administrator about his goals to advance NOAA's mission of science, service, and stewardship. NOAA has an important role to play in addressing climate crisis, and we are fortunate to have an experienced leader like this administrator to guide the agency. In closing, I again want to welcome you, administrator, and this will be our first many positive interactions we have with this committee. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. We're also pleased to have the full committee ranking member, Mr. Lucas, with us today. So the chair now recognizes ranking member Lucas for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Cheryl. And I echo my colleagues. Welcome to Administrator Fred Rabb. It's great to have you here today. NOAA has a broad array of responsibilities, ranging from weather forecasting and climate prediction to ocean and atmospheric observation. 
NOAA's work benefits America's farmers and ranchers, coastal communities, disaster personnel. Land use planners, weather forecasters, and everyday citizens rely on NOAA's daily work. NOAA's in-house research is groundbreaking, and the publicly available environmental data they collect has an immense economic impact. That's why I'm eager to hear from Administrator Dr. Rick Spinrod today. As NOAA's former chief scientist and head of the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, I know that the administrator is very familiar with this committee and the work we do. In fact, to give you a sense of how intertwined our paths have been, Administrator Spinrad was present in his official OAR capacity at the 2006 dedication of the National Weather Center in Norman, Oklahoma. There's a great picture of him right next to Jim Cantori that I'll have to share someday with uh, everyone. All of this is to say, I believe the administrator speaks the science committee's language. While we might not agree on the exact way to do certain things, I think we can engage in a meaningful discussion where both sides are heard and valued. At the end of the day, weather is nonpartisan. Severe events don't travel along party lines. That's why I will remind my colleagues, just as I have done in years past when Republicans were in control, the administration's top priority should be aligned with NOAA's core priority, protecting life and property. So today, I look forward to hearing from the administrator on how he envisions advancing NOAA's mission and improving its ability to save lives. One issue I'd like to address today is commercial data supply. NOAA provides tools, data, and operations that are capable to, to liter applicable to literally every single district in the country. Whether it's a rancher in Oklahoma, a fishing captain in Florida, a firefighter in Oregon, they all depend on information NOAA provides. But as more private sector companies enter the picture with the ability to gather their own environmental and weather data, NOAA must seek to balance its capacities with supplemental commercial data. Simply put, NOAA is no longer the only provider in the market, and oftentimes NOAA's collection of data costs more than that acquired uh, of the same quantity of data from a private sector company. I can't assume, I literally say that we can't assume an endless increasing budget. At some point, the balloon will pop, believe me. I want NOAA to be successful across its mission areas. We can best ensure that by prioritizing funding and standing up programs to acquire data that private industry cannot collect while preparing for a commercially competitive future. Again, I want to thank Administrator Spinrad for being here today, Chairman Cheryl for having this hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ranking Member Lucas. Um, at this time, I'd like to give the opportunity for Representative Bonamici to introduce her fellow Oregonian, and I yield to Ms. Bonamici. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, members. It is really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Spinrad, the current administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and a fellow Oregonian. Dr. Spinrad is an internationally renowned scientist and leader with more than 35 years of experience. In 2014, then President Obama nominated Dr. Spinrad to serve as NOAA's chief scientist. From 2003 until 2010, he served as the head of NOAA's Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research and the National Ocean Service. Dr. Spinrad has also held leadership positions at the U.S. Office of Naval Research and Oceanographer of the Navy and was awarded Distinguished Civilian Service Award, the Navy's highest award for civilians. Throughout his career, Dr. Spinrad has held multiple faculty positions, including most recently as a professor of oceanography at Oregon State University. Earlier this year, I had the honor of introducing Dr. Spinrad at his confirmation hearing in front of the Senate Commerce Science and Transportation Committee. Dr. Spinrad's successful confirmation makes him the 11th no administrator, the first Senate confirmed leader, as Ranking Member Vice mentioned, since January of 2017 and the third from Oregon State. Now, as members of this committee, especially Representative Gonzalez knows, my alma mater is the University of Oregon, and yet I am extremely proud of Oregon State University here. Since assuming the position of NOAA Administrator in June, Dr. Spinrad has been a force, preserving and strengthening 
NOAA's core mission of science, service, and stewardship. In July, NOAA established a climate council, which will be comprised of senior leaders from across the agency and entrusted with coordinating climate work across NOAA. The council is also tasked with advancing equitable delivery of NOAA's science to all communities, and especially those most severely affected by climate change. Additionally, last week, NOAA announced $41 million in grants for coastal, oceanic, and Great Lakes observation programs. And that's going to help the scientific community and others better stand, better understand our invaluable coast and respond to climate change. So I want to thank Dr. Spinred for spending time with the subcommittee this morning. I look forward to hearing more about the important work NOAA is doing as our nation's premier climate science agency. Thank you again to your Cheryl, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. As our witness should know, you will have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you've completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the witness. With that, I'm pleased to turn it over to Administrator Spinrad. Chair Cheryl, Ranking Member Bice, members of the subcommittee, as well as uh, Chair Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas, Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding my priorities for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Special thanks also to Representative Bonamici for that very kind introduction. Thank you. One week from today marks my 100th day as administrator of NOAA. This is my third tour of duty at NOAA. Previously, I served as chief scientist during the Obama administration. And before that, I led our Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research and the National Ocean Service. The urgency with which NOAA is working to address our nation's most pressing challenges is like never before. From combating the climate crisis and bolstering the equitable delivery of climate science and services, reinforcing scientific integrity, and rebuilding our scientific workforce. Ensuring our agency is diverse, equitable, inclusive, and accessible. To promoting economic development while maintaining environmental stewardship, the NOAA workforce has been firing on all cylinders to meet the increasing demands of our nation. That mission is science, service, and stewardship. To understand and predict changes in climate, weather, oceans, and coasts, to share that knowledge with others, and to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystems and resources. As NOAA Administrator, I'd like to share with you my main priorities in pursuit of this mission and in alignment with the goals of the Biden-Harris administration. The first pillar of that mission, our science, is at the core of our agency and is the foundation for smart policy and decision-making. From the depths of the ocean to the surface of the sun, we are observing and collecting data and turning those data into Earth system models, information, tools, and forecasts. NOAA's trusted data are the basis for your weekend weather forecasts. Provide our constituents with harmful algal bloom warnings, and feed into our models that predict wildlife and wildfire smoke movement in real time. It is essential that NOAA's data and information adhere to the principles of scientific integrity to maintain our trusted status and issue life-saving weather forecasts and warnings, as well as our climate predictions and projections. The Biden-Harris administration has made upholding scientific integrity a main priority, and I've already taken steps to ensure NOAA not only meets but exceeds those expectations, including by requiring all NOAA political appointees to complete scientific integrity training. The second pillar of our mission is service, and I have made it one of my top priorities to expand NOAA's role as the primary authoritative provider of federal climate products and services that can be applied to a diverse range of missions, just as NOAA is the authoritative provider of weather forecasts, navigational charts, and fishery stock assessments. We play a unique role in that not only do we collect data and conduct research, but we are mandated to make it operational. This means we must provide the public and our federal, state, tribal, and industry partners with actionable environmental information to make decisions in the face of climate change. These decisions can range from municipalities looking to ensure new construction will be resilient to sea level rise, flooding, and heavy precipitation. Large insurance companies seeking to incorporate climate risk into their insurance policies or a resident of New Orleans wondering if they should rebuild or relocate after the latest hurricane. My vision 
is that no matter the need, people will know they can turn to NOAA for reliable, easy to use climate information. We are seeing increasing demands for this kind of information as demonstra demonstrated by the record setting summer of extreme heat, drought, wildfires, floods, hurricanes, and other extreme events. The climate crisis is upon us and requires a whole of government response. The third pillar of our mission is stewardship. Stewardship means that we conserve our lands, waters, and natural resources, protecting people and the environment now and for generations to come. As an agency under the Department of Commerce, NOAA is dedicated to promoting economic development while maintaining environmental stewardship. The two can go hand in hand. We create opportunities for sustainable economic growth across the country, including by providing training for the next generation of climate-ready workers. This aligns with another of my top priorities, to advance the new blue economy, which means looking to the ocean for data and information that can be applied to sustainable business development in new and traditional ocean-based sectors. The new blue economy offers opportunities for climate-smart innovation and economic growth. To fully realize NOAA's mission, I've made equity a central focus to ensure that equity is not something that we do, but rather everything we do. This will better position NOAA to help tackle the climate crisis, produce better science, deliver better services, be better stewards of the environment and the economy, and build a more inclusive workforce. Thank you all for again inviting me here today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Well, thank you. At this point, we will begin our first round of questions. The chair recognizes herself for five minutes. Um, Dr. Spinrad, flooding is the most common and widespread of all weather-related natural disasters in the United States. And in North Jersey, we've seen the devastating effects of repeat flooding events for business owners and community members. Earlier this month, we saw devastating and deadly flooding brought by the remnants of Hurricane Ida. Unfortunately, our forecasts were not as accurate as they can be, and that's due in large part to outdated precipitation data. In fact, one woman in my district whose house flooded and who had to be rescued by boat along with her young children during the storm said to me, you know, at five o'clock, I heard that we were going to be fine, that the storm was going to pass to the west. So that's why I introduced a package of bipartisan bills to address flooding called the Floods Act and the Precip Act. Dr. Spinrad, can you speak to the importance of having long-term, accurate, and complete weather data and climate data? What's NOAA doing to ensure communities get the information they need to improve safety and resilience? Thank you, Chair Cheryl. And I, I um, concur completely with the uh, premise that you've stated in your question with regard to the need for improved forecasts. You know, when we look at what happened in the Northeast with both Hurricanes Henri and Ida, uh, we saw, for example, in Central Park, a 100-year-old record for rain rate, rainfall rate, broken twice. Uh, once uh, with Hurricane Henri, where we saw 1.3 inches per hour, and then just uh, a few days later, a week, uh, two weeks later, we saw Hurricane Ida come through, where we got over three inches of rain in the New York, New Jersey area in an hour. So. Uh, we certainly recognize that this is a critical area that we need to focus on. We've made a lot of improvement in forecasts overall, forecasts for severe storms. With respect to floods specifically, and I should point out this is all based on our concept of impact-based decision support. So we want to make sure where we make the improvements in flood forecasts, for example, they are specific to where the impacts are greatest in, in lives and property. Part of this is going to be about increasing the resolution of forecasts. So what we have recognized is that, especially with flooding, how fine a grid one has in the models that are used by forecasters to predict where flooding is going to occur is critical, uh, perhaps more critical than many other environmental phenomena. To do that means advanced capabilities and high-performance computing. It means taking advantage of uh, newer kinds of observations, more sophisticated radars, uh, and doing research on high-resolution processes. I'd also point out it means, especially in the case of flooding, probably upping our game with respect to working with our sister agencies. Part of the flooding equation, if you will, 
is a really good understanding of the topography and the landscape, which means close coordination with our colleagues at agencies like the U.S. Geological Survey. And then the last piece, I think, to do this fine tuning, the higher resolution that's required for uh, example, to provide the accurate forecast for the constituent that you just described, is making sure that the great research that we're doing in our laboratories and with our colleagues in academia is effectively transitioned. We can't afford to say, yeah, 20 years from now, we're going to have a great research product for you. Uh, and so I'm moving out aggressively to try to in institute processes that allow us to do test beds, evaluations, get that product, if you will, out of the laboratory into the weather forecast office much sooner than we might have done in the past. Um, I applaud you for those efforts. They're incredibly necessary, certainly in, in Northern Jersey and other areas across the country. So in April, we held a hearing on the importance of working toward climate equity and the need for improved climate services provided by the federal government. We heard from witnesses about the growing need for authoritative, actionable climate information delivered in an accessible manner. This is critical to helping communities across America make informed decisions. And you sort of, um, I think, alluded to this in your discussion about getting that information out. So I have just a, a few seconds and we can come back depending on the length of the hearing, but um, I'd love to understand uh, your vision for expanding NOAA's delivery of climate services to ensure that every American business and organization has equitable access to information, tools, services they need to adapt to the changing climate. And what additional mandates would NOAA uh, need to achieve this vision? And I'll, I'll take my uh, answer for the record at this point. I may come back to you after others have had time to ask a question. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, you. Now I'd like to recognize our um, ranking member, Ms. Weiss. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, Dr. Spinrad, earlier this week, uh, I introduced legislation co-sponsored uh, by Congresswoman Cheryl that focuses on the NOAA weather radio. Many people don't know this alert system exists, but in Oklahoma, we are all too familiar with the life-saving capabilities these small radios have. Also, many of us uh, are very familiar with the beeping it makes, uh, maybe in the middle of the night to make sure you're aware that there are thunderstorms headed your way. Um, while maintaining the existing system is certainly a priority, I worry about the ever-digitized future where a handheld radio is viewed as obsolete. Can you talk about the future of NOAA weather radio and the potential for upgrades? Specifically, can you touch on transitioning to IP-based communications, backup continuity options like satellites, and alternative options to reach the most remote areas of the country? Yes, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Vice. This is a, a critical capability that NOAA uh, brought to the fore uh, a couple of decades ago. And, and I would make one quick point with respect to NOAA Weather Radio. It had started as NOAA Weather Radio, that it was going to provide weather information. Um, it has been such a success that, um, as I think you know, it's now expanded to a vast array of warning capabilities, including being used for Amber Alerts for uh, lost children, for example. So the tool has proven its worth extraordinarily. It reaches 95% of the American population right now, which is terrific, but it's not good enough. And in fact, that last mile, um, and if you will, to some extent, the digital gap that a lot of the population faces is what we are trying to address. You, you, you talked about the modernization and brought up the what I would say are two of the main components that we are working on right now. One is the incorporation through internet uh, providers so that we do in fact uh, expand the capability uh, we also are looking at the increased number of transmitters out there. It turns out we can get from 95 to 97 percent of the American population with somewhere between about 50 and 100 new transmitters out there. So we know there are certain things we can do with current technology. And then finally, yes, absolutely, we are looking at the expanded capabilities for satellite-based backup for NOAA weather radio. This is where the commercial sector is going. It makes perfect sense. That's part of our current thinking about moving forward. And, and I would uh, simply close by adding that it's my expectation as administrator that just as we have seen NOAA Weather Radio going from, if you will, just weather forecast to a broader array of capabilities, I foresee NOAA Weather Radio in the future to be effectively NOAA Environmental Radio, that it'll be providing all range of environmental forecasts and predictions for the full spectrum of uh, hazards and nat other natural events that we have to be 
warning people about. So there is a lot of opportunity for expanded capability and modernization of NOAA Weather Radio. Perfect. Well, speaking of modernization, as both Ranking Member Lucas and myself mentioned in our opening statements, which should tell you about the importance of it, Oklahoma is the home to the National Weather Center. It houses NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory and the Storm Prediction Center. Um, The work being done there is absolutely essential to predicting and alerting the public of severe weather, but also understanding the root causes of severe weather and exploring innovative ways to use that knowledge to improve forecasts and warnings. But as these extreme events become more common, the need for more equipment, more full-time employees, and more space to operate is becoming urgent. Do you believe the National Weather Center is in need of expansion and upgrades? And what would an investment in the center do for training the next generation of meteorologists? Thank you for that question. And I would point out that uh, as Ranking Member Lucas brought up in his opening statement, I am very proud of the fact that my name is on that building. I was the head of Uh, the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research when the building was put up uh, and have followed its progress ever since. I've been there many, many times. And uh, in the uh, spirit of your question, just this past week, I had a long conversation with Dr. Barry and Moore, whom I think you probably know from the university. Um, I've known Barry and for years and years, and he brought up the issue of potential expansion. I shared with him that I think the model that was originally invoked to establish the National Weather Center is just as valid now as it was then. What I would like to do is undertake the effort, try to figure out what are the expansion requirements and opportunities for NOAA's facilities. And NOAA has both research and operational facilities at the Weather Center. So I'm fully prepared to uh, pursue that question, a close conjunction with our colleagues at the university. And also interestingly with some of the private sector Uh, inhabitants, if you will, occupants of some of the facilities right near the center. So I look forward to having that discussion, and I do think there is opportunity for consideration of expansion potential. Thank you, Dr. Spinrad. And uh, Congresswoman Cheryl, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Bice. I now recognize the chairwoman of the full committee, Ms. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Doctor, on a March report, Uh, by this committee's uh, majority staff found that NOAA's overall workforce declined by almost 9% over the last decade. And further, the report found that NOAA, particularly uh, in its uh, STEM workforce, suffers from gender and racial minority staffing disparities. These findings are deeply concerning to me And I'm committed to working with my colleagues to ensure that NOAA's workforce and the rest of the federal science enterprise reflects the diversity of America. Can you please discuss how NOAA is working to address the staffing declines and staff diversity issues identified in this report? And what is the agency doing to attract and retain more minority scientists and staff in a particular uh, African American scientists um, for staff, or how would you, how are you working to create a culture of inclusion? And is there anything Congress can do to help uh, to move these efforts along? Thank you for that question, Chair Johnson. I share uh, all of the concerns you've described. To state quite bluntly, too much of NOAA's workforce looks like me. Um, And uh, in the past, the answer has been, well, we'll fix that over the next several generations. No, that's not good enough. 80% of our uh, workforce is white, 67% is male. Uh, Those numbers are changing slightly, and there are specific things that we are doing. With respect to the hiring process, I can tell you uh, we have staffed more aggressively to bring in um, uh, human capital experts to help uh, move the process of of hiring, uh, accelerated, if you will, and we've seen dramatic improvement in terms of the time it takes to get somebody into the federal government. We're also looking aggressively at direct hire authorities. I would point out NOAA has one of the strongest educational programs with historically black colleges and universities and minority serving institutions. We are not taking enough advantage of that direct connection, if you will. So through education partnership programs, we're looking at how we can um, expand direct hire authority 
give some of the graduates of these minority serving institute, institutions opportunities to come on board more quickly. Uh, I would also point out that we have uh, dramatically enhanced the visibility and engagement with our employee resource groups. We now have a dozen of these for targeted uh, areas of un underrepresented communities within the workforce. I've begun a dialogue with them. We are working aggressively with our Office of Inclusion and Civil Rights to identify where the specific areas are that we can enhance the hiring activity. So there's a number of both programmatic and, and systemic and, if you will, policy areas where I'm moving to try to make very clear that we cannot wait for a generational change. There are things that we need to do right now. The other part, of course, is ensuring that in the hiring process, we make sure we have diverse selection panels and that we make a specific emphasis on recruitment of underrepresented uh, populations within the, uh, within the workforce. Well, thank you very much. Scientific integrity is at the heart of NOAA's work and is vital to ensuring the public's trust in federal science and scientists. However, some deficiencies in NOAA's scientific integrity policy were exposed in a June 2020 report by the National Academy of Public Administration following Hurricane Darian and the Sharpgate incident. Uh, I understand that NOAA's scientific integrity policy was updated in January, but remains unclear what specific steps uh, NOAA is taking to implement the recommendations from the NAP NAPA report. Can you explain that briefly? Absolutely. I take scientific integrity very seriously. I was, in fact, the co-author of NOAA's original scientific integrity policy some 12 years ago when we had serious concerns about political influence on the science. Uh, that policy was held up as one of the examples of one of the better policies among federal agencies for many years. Uh, I was not with the government uh, back when that policy was tested a few years ago in the incident that you described. Uh, but I will share with you that I was an outside complainant uh, uh, referencing that particular activity, and I saw where the scientific integrity policy had some flaws. And so coming in as NOAA administrator, I'm making sure that we are actively participating in the, in the effort being led by the President Science Advisor, Eric Lander, to take best practices among all the federal agency scientific integrity policies, establish them as the norm, and develop a government-wide approach to scientific integrity. So that's one thing, taking the best of class programs, if you will. The other is, uh, one of the things we learned was that within uh, NOAA and specifically the Department of Commerce, our parent agent, our parent department, we needed to see bolstering of department uh, policies as well. So I have been in discussion with our Deputy Secretary Graves about how NOAA can work with the department to ensure the department's policies are uh, strong and effective as well. The third thing I would bring up is that from the day I arrived, I uh, insisted that we make all political appointees at NOAA uh, take the scientific integrity training and demonstrate an awareness of and familiarity of and respect for NOAA's scientific in integrity policy. And I can tell you that as of today, every one of our appointees has taken that scientific integrity training, including myself. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ms. Cheryl Ayu. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Lucas, for five minutes. Thank you. Administrator Spring read my bill, the Weather Research and Forecasting Innovation Act of 2017, is the birthplace of NOAA's commercial weather data program. So as you might imagine, I'm quite invested in its success. So can you, as you can imagine, I, I was thrilled when NOAA awarded its third delivery order in August, but I'm concerned that we could be leaving valuable data on the table. As I understand it, companies that were not in orbit at the time NOAA initiated its commercial data buy program are not eligible to participate until a new proposal is initiated, potentially a year from now. So after successfully testing and verification by NOAA, what recourse does a commercial company have to immediately engage with NOAA to provide this life-saving data for weather forecast? 
Thank you for that question, Ranking Member uh, Lucas. Uh, I would point out that I do share your appreciation for and desire to see a more uh, uh, strong exploitation of commercial data. There's a cautionary note, of course, with regard to the use of commercial data, and that is we need to make sure that it meets the standards that are applied and also that it's uh, sustainable. Uh, the, uh, in the worst case scenario, we end up developing products and services that are critically dependent on the provision of commercial data. And then for a variety of economic or business reasons, those data are not available downstream. So part of the exercise, part of what we do in the evaluation process that we are now undertaking with respect, for example, to the data you alluded to, which is actually um, data looking at something called radio occultation, how satellite data changes as it goes through the atmosphere. Uh, we're getting 3,000 profiles a day. It's really exciting to see how we're going to use that data, how it will improve the forecast. Once those assessments are made, uh, and it will take a little bit of time for the research to be done, for the demonstration of the efficacy and impact of those data, we're going to want to make sure that we have established processes and mechanisms to ensure the data quality, the data accuracy, and the sustained uh, availability of those data. All of that is fully consistent with the Weather Act and everything that uh, you built into the Weather, Weather Act. And uh, I am eager in the spirit of being in the Department of Commerce to bolster economic development, to see that we can come to a place where there is a uh, clear uh, enterprise approach to acquiring commercial data, ensuring its accuracy, and it's in ensuring its sustainability. I appreciate that. And as long as it's an ongoing process, uh, I, that, I think that's the direction we're headed. On a similar note, I want to talk about space weather data. This committee passed the Pro-SWIFT Act last Congress, and I was keen to include an amendment allowing NOAA to enter into contracts to acquire commercial space weather data. In a meeting with my staff, NOAA informed us that space weather data capacities were included in the commercial weather data program's most recent request for information. A number of companies responded, but none met NOAA's mission need. The RFI was sent out in September before the Pro-SWIFT Act, uh, and it wasn't signed into the law until October. So while NOAA may have been proactive, I don't believe their updated responsibilities for space weather-related research forecasting and capacity perhaps were fully considered in the RFI. So, Administrator, can you comment on, uh, can you commit to publish another RFI or request proposals that would uh, be related to this com space weather commercial data? So, Ranking Member Lucas, what I would like to do is get back to you on the specifics of how that played out. Um, but you have my commitment to look into that and see what the appropriate um, next step would be. That's all I can ask. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ranking Member Lucas. And now I'm going to defer to committee counsel for the order of recognition. Ms. Bonamici is recognized. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Spinrad. Uh, I wanna talk about hypoxia. For, for many years now, hypoxic zones I have been observed in the coastal waters off the Pacific Northwest. The location of these hypoxic zones changes on a yearly basis, so predicting them can be challenging. Ocean temperatures are warming. There could be a decrease in the water's ability to retain oxygen, and that makes it worse. So this year, Oregon grappled with one of the most intense and prolonged hypoxic seasons to date. Now, these episodes not only disrupt ecosystems by killing off marine species, they also disrupt, as you are well aware, the coastal economies. Escalating episodes of hypoxia are threatening Oregon's prized Dungeness crabs, for example. Uh, that's, they, that industry has been responsible for an average of $39.5 million in, of uh, annual value over the past couple of decades. So, Dr. Spinrad, what are some of the biggest challenges NOAA faces right now in monitoring, predicting, and preventing hypoxia? And what can Congress do? I mean, in addition to providing sufficient appropriations in the fiscal year 22 cycle, what can Congress do to address these challenges? Yes, thank you for that question, uh, Congresswoman Bonamici. And I am very familiar with the issues, um, as I think uh, many Oregonians are and many folks in the U.S. are as well, because it impacts seafood prices and availability. Right. The quick, uh, and, or I shouldn't say quick, but the fundamental issue here is observational capability, that uh, we are building out capabilities for measuring hypoxia. This is one of those phenomena for which the observational capability was needed many years ago, but it's now only currently uh, really getting 
uh, hardened and, and firmed up. And in fact, we're working with the fishing communities do that. Uh, you may be aware that some of the uh, crabbers off the Oregon coast now include dissolved oxygen sensors on their crab pots right, as right. a device for making these observations. So we're incorporating that within the integrated ocean observing system I used as one of the many parameters that are being uh, observed. Research investments into the predictability is the one of the tough nuts to crack. It's one thing to say, this is what happened yesterday uh, in the ocean. It's another thing to say, be prepared, this is gonna happen next week. So we're doing extensive research through our cooperative institutes with the fishery science centers, with the universities uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I should point out, we also have the authority for developing the harmful algal blooms and hypoxia events of national significance right. strategy. Right. And that, thank you for the support on that. Uh, we will be putting out the federal register notice on that draft policy very soon. And so I think once we see what kind of comments we get back and what kind of input we get back and, and people understand what is NOAA's responsibility, what is EPA's responsibility, I think we will have a better handle on specifically how we want to address this, both from a policy, yeah. appropriations, and programmatic. Standpoint. Thank you, Dr. Spinner. That's that's really helpful. I, I want to ask you too. Um, I really appreciate that NOAA is engaged in the extensive efforts to prepare for, adapt to, and mitigate the worst effects of climate cri the climate crisis, particularly on uh, oceans, coasts, fisheries, estuaries. So I want to ask you about the Climate Council. Uh, the council reflects, of course, as you mentioned, the Biden administration's whole of government approach. Uh, so I want to ask, how are things going? Is the council fully formed and operating? And what are its priorities? Yes, thank you for that. Um, so the NOAA Climate Council is the only council that reports directly to me. We have a lot of councils for facilities, for human resources, for many things. This council was set up shortly after I arrived as administrator, and it is the leading career folks from the agency, the people in charge of the weather service, the ocean service, satellites, uh, the assistant administrators. Already, we have used this council to establish priorities as we formulate our FY23 budget form, uh, and, and has helped build the equity framework for climate products and services. So I now have in front of me, if you will, a guidance document that this council has developed. We're also using this council to engage the rest of, uh, of government. So we invited uh, the uh, special envoy for climate, John Kerry, his office to come talk with our right. NOAA Climate Council as well. And we're doing the same thing within the Department of Commerce. So it serves as a two-way communication mechanism and a strategic body to define policies and priorities for the agency. That's very encouraging. And, and in my remaining time, I want to follow up on Chairwoman Johnson's question. We've had many conversations in this in, in the subcommittee, but also in the full committee over the years on diversifying the workforce and the sciences. Um, and one of the things in particular is that I've been aware of is the lack of women in, in jobs, uh, particularly at NOAA. Uh, and it's getting women in the field, but also keeping them there. So I want to ask you, Dr. Spinrad, will you commit to carrying on the policies and practices that Dr. Sullivan, when she was no administrator, put in place to help address sexual harassment, uh, which has been a problem, particularly on research vessels. Yeah, absolutely is my short answer. I'll go one further than my good colleague and, and mentor in many respects, Kathy Sullivan. We have already set up a SASH, sexual assault, sexual harassment council. We have uh, in, in built in many processes, especially with the NOAA Corps and our ships to make sure that we have prevented that. We have established an office for workplace violence prevention and response. So we have done, we've taken a lot of actions in setting up uh, facilities and mechanisms. I am gonna make a, a very strong message, have made a very strong message in that regard. And I've got to point out that for, I'm pretty sure it's the first time in NOAA history, half of our assistant administrators are women right now. Um, we will have an opportunity shortly because the head of the National Weather Service, Louis Uccellini, a national icon in weather, has announced his retirement. We may have an wow. opportunity to have a woman in that position as well. So we are moving out aggressively and doing things and setting policy. Accordingly. Thank you for that commitment. And my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Feenstra is recognized. Thank you, uh, Chair Sherrill and Ranking Member Bice. Uh, Administrator uh, 
SPINRAD, excited to continue legislation to establish research and testing program to mitigate the impact of radar obstructions on detection and uh, prediction capabilities. Uh, these obstructions were addressed in a fall 2019 joint study on the impact of wind farms and weather radar. As you know, radar forecasting and the detection can be affected by nearby buildings, terrain, and wind turbines. That said, it is crucial that we do not restrict the growth of clean wind energy by putting excessive red tape on wind farm construction. Administrator Spinrad, my potential legislation would focus on researching and testing options like new processing algorithms, phased array radar, commercial data, and other technologies. It would involve consultation with private industry, academia, NOAA, the FAA, and the DOD, among other groups. Has NOAA or other National Weather Services conducted research on specific technology-based options to reduce obstruction issues when developing NEXRAD or other systems? Yes, thank you for that question, and I especially appreciate your invoking the uh, issues with our colleagues at DOD and FAA who share similar concerns. And as a consequence, uh, we have a wind turbine radar interference working group that is addressing those issues. It's chaired by the Department of Energy. Um, I would say that there are a couple of uh, potential approaches. You alluded to one, that is... Um, uh, beam forming using the current NEXRAD systems in slightly different manners. We are researching that. Uh, I would also point out a, as a bit of an aside, I worked for Navy many years and I uh, became fascinated with the use of phased array radar by the Navy as a potential weather radar. And for many years, going on 20 years now, I've been a strong advocate of the potential application of phased array radar uh, as a, a potential replacement for NEXRAD. So in conjunction with your question, not just how do we use NEXRAD, what are the approaches we might take, but can we use the next generation radars like phased array as a solution while balancing the growth of the renewable energy industry? Uh, thanks for those comments, Administrator Spinrad. I, I greatly appreciate that type of collaboration. And, you know, we need to all work together on this. And I just simply ask, would you and other members of your team at NOAA be open to joining uh, with my office and other representatives from the wind ener energy industry uh, to have a fruitful discussion on potential legislative solutions for mitigating the effects of radar obstructions? Of course, we'd be more than happy to cooperate. Well, I'm very, I'm very grateful for that, and thank you. This is such a big topic. Uh, my district is is number one agriculture or number one wind producer uh, in the country. So, uh, thank you for that. Thank you. And I yield back. Mr. Kildy is recognized. Mm -hmm. I guess I needed to unmute. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Chairwoman Cheryl, for hosting this hearing. Uh, and Dr. Spinrad, thank you so much for your presence and your testimony. Uh, I come from Michigan, where the Great Lakes are quite literally our lifeblood. Uh, the lakes outline our boundaries. They define who we are as a state. And we have 10,000 miles of Great Lakes shoreline uh, in this region. They're central to our livelihood. They're central to our economy. Uh, part of my district that I represent includes the Lake Huron shoreline, which is a part of this really vibrant coastal economy. Uh, according to NOAA, Michigan, uh, Michigan's coastal economy employs uh, 1.75 million people each year, $92 billion in wages. And the Great Lakes fishing industry is critical to the health of these communities across the region. According to the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, commercial, recreational, tribal fisheries generate $7 billion in economic activity annually and support 75,000 jobs throughout the region. Uh, so we look to strengthen and bolster our coastal uh, communities. As we do that, uh, one of the things that um, has evolved is fish farming, aquaculture. Now, when done correctly, this is important. When done properly, aquaculture can create a high quality food source that's abundant and affordable. However, and importantly, when done improperly, it can do much more harm than good. And we've seen in Michigan proposals for net pen aquaculture in the Great Lakes. 
There's even one aquaculture operation on the Asabo River, which, if you know it, contains the so-called holy waters of trout fishing, a very sensitive uh, ecosystem that supports uh, trout. These operations can create massive pollution. They can spread disease. They can spawn invasive species. They could threaten this multi-billion dollar fisheries in the Great Lakes. At one time, uh, NOAA, the NOAA Sea Grant Program was encouraging aquaculture operations in the Great Lakes. And that's why here in Congress, I have introduced legislation to ban harmful aquaculture practices in both the Great Lakes and in federally designated wild and scenic rivers, which would include the Asabo uh, in my district. So, Dr. Spindrad, if you could discuss the role of aquaculture in NOAA's concept of a new blue economy and commit to us that ensuring that aquaculture is not used directly within the Great Lakes or in the wild and scenic rivers like the Asabo. Could you comment on that? Yes, thank you, Representative Kildee. And I, I think I was listening very carefully to uh, the way you uh, asked your question and you used uh, one phrase, you said, when aquaculture is done properly, uh, it may have benefits. And I think that's really the sweet spot for what NOAA can bring to the table. And, and oh, by the way, as you well know, we're very proud of our resources, the Sea Grant Program, but also the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, uh, which provides our main access for research activity in all of the Great Lakes. Properly, in my opinion, means that the science has been done in a credible, peer-reviewed, uh, uh, valuable manner to assess what is the real impact, what are the real environmental or ecological consequences of any particular approach. That is our responsibility, to drive what states and other local authorities may do then to interpret that science with establishing policies associated with aquaculture. It's, it's the same argument that I would make with respect to offshore aquaculture in the open ocean, that we have a responsibility for ensuring that the determination of what is proper is based on the best possible scientific information we can collect. And that's where I'm confident that between Sea Grant, our Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, we have the horsepower and the intellectual uh, capacity to do those kinds of studies that will provide the answers that policymakers like yourself will need to make the right decisions. Well, I appreciate that very much, Dr. Spinrad. And I wonder if you, in the few remaining seconds we have, if you might comment on other ways we can improve the blue economy in these coastal communities within the Great Lakes. Well, my short answer, sir, is to listen. Um, we, the feds, are doing that right now. We're doing a number of regional uh, climate equity roundtables to hear what are the answers to exactly the question you raised specific to the Great Lakes. I'll be in Detroit in, I think, the second week in October to do exactly that. And I don't want to presume or pre-designate what we think the answer is for building out the blue economy in the Great Lakes. I've got my own personal views based on my experience, but I really want to listen to the municipalities, the industries, the local communities, the stakeholders, your constituents, and hear what they think they need in order to build out the blue economy on the coasts of the great, on the shores of the Great Lakes. Well, again, thank you so much. I appreciate this. I appreciate the hearing, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Mr. Kasten is recognized. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Spinner. Thank you so much for coming, and thanks to the committee. I want to. Uh, I want to chat a little bit about methane monitoring. Um, it's, it's, you know, as, as you know, I see it nodding your head. You know, depending on the time frame, we're talking about 30 to 80 times as potent a greenhouse gas as CO2. I'm sure you're aware we are currently debating some rules about possibly putting a, 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 a fee um, on the, the release of methane. And the, the nature of that fee is outside the jurisdiction of this committee. The way we calculate the methane emissions are potentially outside of the jurisdiction of this committee. If we're talking about using, you know, company meters and netting those out at production, collection, distribution, and consumption facilities. But it's my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there's potentially as much as a 60% gap between the amount of methane we calculate from bottom-up analyses of meters to top-down analyses from, from the satellites under your, uh, your control and therefore to some degree our jurisdiction. And, you know, some of that is because of 
malfunctions in the meter, just meter, some of that's malfunctions and burps that come out. And, and what I'm wondering is if you could educate us a little bit first on the degree to which, um, uh, you know, either ground or satellite based systems you have contract methane and specifically to what degree you have the granularity to actually get down and locate the point of methane release. Um, and let me stop there. I'll have some follow-up questions, but I, I see you nodding your head and would welcome uh, your general thoughts on that question. Yes, thank you so much, Congressman Kasman. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is commit to get a uh, technical briefing to your staff on exactly that. We've got some wonderful uh, scientists working, especially in a laboratory in Boulder, on observational technologies. And I'd like to uh, have them talk specifically about what I know to be some of the highly geographically variable uh, variations in that in that difference that you described. So maybe 60% in one place and maybe 10 in another, what are the reasons for that? Part of it also is the dynamics of what's driving the distribution of methane so that you may not be able to observe it with one particular technology or another. Y you already started to go down the answer that I was going to uh, bring up, and that is the bottom-up, top-down approach. So we interpret bottom-up effectively to mean Give me a list of all the sources. You've got, you know, so many cattle operations. You've got so many um, big buildings. You've got so many sources in a particular area. Do the math. That means you should have so many tons of methane emitted per day. The top down is that you are using atmospheric observations to actually make these measurements and try to conclude what the total emission is in a particular area. The gap between that bottom up and top down is highly variable as well, and so. That's where our research is trying to figure out how to close the gap. A lot of it depends on understanding the chemical dynamics and the physical dynamics of how the methane moves around and how it changes. You are absolutely right. It's a very potent greenhouse gas, but it has a much, much shorter uh, half-life, if you will, uh, than uh, carbon dioxide, which is why it's some of those variations are dependent on the times when observations mm -hmm. were made. So it's a rich area for research, and I'd love to make sure we've got your staff uh, access to our current capabilities. Um, well, let's definitely do that. And, and, and I want to just, just not to pick on the point, but I, I understand that, you know, the methane is going to move through the atmosphere and you're going to try to figure it out. But as with the data you have, or if you'd prefer with the data you could have subject to future technologies and future funding we might allocate, do you have the technical ability, at least in theory, in a, in a fiscally uncapped world, to go down and identify the specific location of a methane release, or is that an insoluble problem? Are we always going to be stuck depending on these bottoms up meters that don't quite tie out? But my impression is that we have the technical capability. It's, it's a pragmatic question of can you deploy that number of sensors uh, to make the kinds of observations you're talking about. Uh, I, I could characterize, for example, to the milli-degree, what the difference in temperature is between my home and Falls, Falls Church and Capitol Hill. But to do so, I'd want to have many, many different temperature sensors between Falls Church and Capitol Hill. Similarly with methane, our ability to pinpoint is going to depend on the um, intensity of observational systems that we've got in place. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. And let's follow up offline, as, as I'm sure you can appreciate I, I want to make sure that if we're going to go through and, you know, and create these monetization of pollution externalities, which I think is a good market focused thing to do, that we're including everybody in that mix. And as long as there's a gap, we have a we have a problem. And I don't know at this point whether that's a science problem or a or an algebra problem, but look forward to the continued conversation. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Back. Mr. Chris is recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you, Dr. Spinrad, for being with us today. Uh, I represent Pinellas County in Florida, which is located in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, Pinellas is surrounded on three sides by water, so literally it's a peninsula on the peninsula of Florida. So as you can imagine, I've worked a lot with NOAA. Uh, it is critical to my district and Florida as a whole. Uh, for that reason, I've been a longtime supporter of the agency, uh, have worked closely with NOAA on a number of issues, including addressing red tide. Uh, you may be aware of a bill I introduced last Congress that focused on the prevention and control of harmful algae blooms. So I was pleased to see Noah's recent announcement of a new funding opportunity to create harmful algae bloom control technologies incubator. Can you tell me more about this new opportunity and what Noah is seeking to accomplish by it? 
Yes, thank you, Congressman Chris. And thank you for your support over the years. Really appreciate that. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a, an exciting opportunity. It's reflected mm -hmm. in a $7.5 million federal funding opportunity that we put out for uh, Harmful Algal Bloom Control Technology Incubator. Um, and as the name suggests, we're going to solicit the best ideas for controlling technologies. What does best mean? Um, what we're going to look for, obviously, is technical feasibility. Is it a sound scientific concept? We also want to look for environmental acceptability. There may be solutions to mitigate harmful algal blooms that have more damage to the environment than the blooms themselves. So we want to look for that environmental acceptability. And then, of course, the, the, the feasibility, if you will, in terms of scalability. What works in a laboratory may not necessarily work in a larger scale environment. So the technical uh, feasibility, the environmental uh, 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 reliability, if you will, and then the scalability are the three main things that we're going to look for in the proposals that we get. And I'm hoping we get overwhelmed with proposals. Well, as you know, this summer's red tide outbreak in Tampa Bay and along Florida's Gulf Coast has been the worst algae bloom observed in years. And I just read in news accounts this morning, it's returning again off Anna Maria Island. Uh, that's why I wrote to Governor DeSantis, urging him to request that NOAA determine the outbreak as a, quote, harmful algae bloom event of national significance, which would then unlock federal funds for assessment and mitigation. Uh, Congress I'm gave NOAA, sure. I'm sorry, excuse me. Congress gave NOAA and the EPA this authority in 2019, uh, but despite the growing problem of harmful algae blooms, NOAA and the EPA have yet to utilize this authority. Why hasn't NOAA used this authority yet, if you're aware? So the short answer is that we are moving out on that. We have developed or are developing the draft policy for uh, HABs and hypoxia events of national significance and a federal register notice uh, uh, inviting comments from the public on that policy should be coming out very soon. So we have moved out on that and we are working closely with our partners at EPA uh, who share some responsibilities, especially in freshwater on that. So we have moved out, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, as you know, Florida's home to several NOAA facilities. Unfortunately, many of the facilities are in dire need of repairs and upgrades, including the following, Southeast Fisheries Science Center, National Hurricane Center, Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory in Miami. Uh, the impacts of climate change on these facilities makes the situation even more urgent. Can you provide me with an update on NOAA's plans for facility repairs and relocations, particularly in the Southeast? Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like a bit of a placeholder because I, I think we would probably want to spend a little bit more time with you and your staff to give some detailed responses to that. But I can tell you, as somebody who's worked for NOAA for, gosh, almost 20 years now, I've been to almost every NOAA facility, including uh, those in Southeast Florida, uh, over many, many years. And I share concerns about sustaining capabilities. We can't be asking our scientists to be doing work in facilities where their safety and their ability to get clean power and clean water is compromised. So we have undertaken a number of regional assessments of our facilities to see where are the priorities for investment. We have a $400 million deferred maintenance bill at NOAA and we're just having a hard time just keeping up. We are hoping some of the, some of the moves on the Hill with respect to infrastructure will help resolve mm -hmm. that, but specifically what facilities and what priority and, and, and where to spend are part of this comprehensive study. We've done four of the regional studies. We've got two more that we will do as tabletop exercises in the next several months. Great. Thank you very much, doctor. I see I'm running out of time, so I will go back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Babin is recognized. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member. Uh, and Dr. Spinrad, uh, thank you for appearing today as well. I'm the Ranking Member on the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee of this same full committee. While most of NOAA falls under the Environment Subcommittee's jurisdiction, the Office of Space Commerce, or OSC, falls under the Space Subcommittee's jurisdiction. The committee has a long history of oversight and legislation related to space situational awareness, or SSA. Last year, the National Academy of Public Administration issued an independent report that concluded Number one, the Department of Commerce is best suited to perform SSA tasks within the federal government. And that OSC views STM, space traffic management, as predominantly a data management function rather than as a prescriptive regulatory role. 
And three, the Department of Commerce, with its proven ability to effectively manage large, diverse, and complex data sets, provides essential technical expertise and other support to the Office of Space Commerce for space situational awareness and traffic management tasks. As a result of of the the NAPA report's findings, uh, the Appropriations Act of fiscal year 2021 approved the merger of the Office of Space Commerce with the Office of Commercial Remote Sensing Regulatory Affairs and also provided $10 million to initiate a pilot program and initiate an open data architecture for space situational awareness. Rather than using these funds to carry out the law, it appears that NOAA, that you all, is using these FY21 funds to pay for for more studies to revisit the topics of the NAPA study. These funding cuts come on top of personnel changes that threaten the Department of Commerce's ability to meet its uh, space situational awareness responsibilities. So Madam Chairwoman, I would like to add two op-eds from the Space News uh, to the record, if you don't mind, please. Two op-eds, Madam Chair, I'd like to have entered into the record. Without objection. All right, thank you. Uh, One is by Brian Whedon from the Secure World Foundation titled uh, Getting Serious About the Office of Space Commerce. And the other is by Dr. Scott Pace, the director of GW Space Policy Institute and our former executive director of our National Space Council titled NOAA is Stalling U.S. Space Traffic Management. Dr. Spinrad, will you commit to implementing uh, the United States Executive Branch policy and carrying out the laws related to space situational awareness? Thank you, uh, Ranking Member, and I I really really appreciate you raising this issue. I will tell you, uh, this is a subject that I have embraced since I was confirmed at the end of June, and I'm having uh, regular meetings with the Deputy Secretary of Commerce to address uh, all of the issues you've identified. Uh, I want to point out that we are taking some very specific actions. I would note, for example, that the data repository associated with space situational awareness that you alluded to Uh, There will be an interagency or a demonstration conducted here very shortly within the next several weeks for our agency partners. And it's our intent then to, uh, based on that demonstration, bring it up to Congress so that you can uh, uh, observe what we've done consistent with the law itself. We're also looking, based on the NAPA report, at a number of alternatives for the organizational design. The Merger that you alluded to is one that requires a careful consideration of the operational responsibilities and regulatory responsibilities. Now we do that at NOAA, we do that in fisheries, we do that in coastal zone management. We just wanna make sure we get it right. So we're looking at alternatives. We'll have that analysis of alternatives ready very shortly. And I would point out that the the space traffic management is a little bit of a different, uh, different animal in terms of need for authorities. Do we have the authorities for actually engaging in space traffic management? And we are looking at that as well. I would close by simply saying there's another op-ed that uh, you may wanna take a look at that Deputy Secretary Don Graves and I wrote to Space News subsequent to the two that you've identified where we tried to clarify what we are doing consistent with the law. Well, before I I run out of time, I asked this question because the authority of the Office of Space Commerce resides with the Secretary of Commerce, not with NOAA and certainly not NESDES. Uh, it is long past time to return that office to the Department of Commerce so that they can leverage all the expertise in, the, in that department and coordinate with other agencies and nations on a level playing field. So I hope uh, hope we can see some expedition uh, happening there. Uh, thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. McNerney is recognized. Well, I thank the chair. Um, and Dr. Spenrad, thank you for appearing today and for your dedication to the scientific enterprise. It's really inspiring to see someone that's uh, so long in the business and still enthusiastic. Um, say a much better understanding is needed of the stratospheric composition and chemistry for more accurate modeling of the climate system dynamics. The GeoExo satellite constellation is scheduled to launch in the early 2030s, including the GeoExo Central which has an atmospheric composition sensor. Uh, Dr. Spinrad, will this satellite as currently planned help build a baseline understanding 
of the stratospheric aerosols? Uh, yes. And how would the resulting data contribute to climate science? So uh, part of climate science, a lot of people tend to think of climate science as purely a physical phenomenon. It's about temperature or winds or water. But a lot of the initial conditions, if you will, that set off what's going to happen are driven by atmospheric chemistry in the, in the most fundamental manner, depending on what the particulates are that are in the atmosphere, they either reflect sunlight resulting in a local cooling, or they may absorb sunlight, which will result in local heating. So having a good understanding of the chemical construct of uh, particulates uh, and the makeup of the atmosphere is a critical initial component to understanding climate. Very good. Well, uh, unfortunately, the GeoExo Constellation satellite launch is still a decade away, but there's an urgent need uh, for actionable data right now. Uh, how can NOAA improve its monitoring and modeling of the atmospheric composition in the short term with the tools and equipment that are currently available? So we have a couple of capabilities, uh, one of which, of course, is uh, thank you to uh, the Hills uh, support for acquisition of another or of a Gulfstream 550, G550. Uh, we will be putting in for an additional G550. Uh, these aircraft, of course, allow us to do relatively high altitude uh, stratospheric observations. So having that platform alone will be a major improvement in our observational capabilities. Very good. Um, what additional resources and policy changes does NOAA need to advance its Earth system science and stewardship mission? I, I think we actually uh, have a lot of authority. We, we have 200 different authorities uh, to conduct a lot of these activities, uh, which in itself is an, an issue we could talk about at some point. Um, but I believe part of this also uh, boils down to understanding what the nature of the uh, interagency dynamic is, which is why I've been rather vocal about NOAA having a uh, lead as the primary authoritative source for climate products and services, just as we are for weather, navigational charts, fisheries stock assessments. I think that's a required capability. Oh, good. So jurisdictional battles are, rest are unrestricted to Congress. <clears throat> so uh, major advance advances have been made in our ability to uh, monitor air quality from satellites. And this is of particular importance to my district which has among the worst air quality in the nation. I'm excited to see that NOAA partnering on the launch of the Tempo satellite instrument, which will monitor air quality during daylight hours and a much higher spatial resolution. Can you describe how NOAA is contributing to this mission and how advanced tropospheric air quality monitoring will contribute to the agency's decision-making? Yeah, I would like to get back to you on that, please, Congressman, because I think that requires a detailed technical uh, element, and I'd like to be able to make sure we get that right. Okay, very good. Well, uh, you know, I spent my career developing wind energy technology, and I'm excited to see that um, offshore wind is being considered in the West Coast, but uh, because of the deeper waters, we require new technology. Um, is NOAA preparing for upcoming lease sales on offshore West Coast projects, uh, which could come as early as next year? We're working very closely with our colleagues at Interior, specifically the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management on exactly those issues. And we have ongoing discussions with respect to some of the leases on the West Coast right now. Yes. Very good, exciting. Well, um, with that, I'm gonna yield back. Thank you. Ms. Lofgren is recognized. Um, first, thank you for letting me pop on, even though I'm not a member of this subcommittee, uh, to ask uh, just a few questions about the wildfire situation uh, this has been just a catastrophe in the West and in our home state of California. And certainly federal resources are needed to address the risks. I think sometimes we underestimate uh, how improving modeling uh, data could actually help in this situation. So I have just a couple questions. First, how will the next generation of NOAA satellites improve wildfire detection and monitoring. Also, what other space-based observation capabilities uh, for near real-time detection has NOAA explored? Have we thought about small um, satellite constellations? And then finally, uh, what is NOAA doing on interagency uh, collaboration when it comes to wildfire modeling and detection as not just 
you know, with other agencies, but also with non-federal partners to improve prevention and response. Yes, thank you for that question, Congresswoman Lofgren. Um, I hail from Oregon. My home in central Oregon uh, was within just a few miles of some of the biggest fires this year. So this, for me, is a very personal issue. Um, and, and oh, by the way, if I can briefly state, I used NOAA information to make a decision to spend money to do a fuel abatement uh, effort on my property. So this touches people at the very personal level right in their pocketbook. Uh, so I resonate very much with the tone of your question. At NOAA, we are responsible, as you indicated, for the detection side using our, our satellites and also aircraft capability. And one of the uh, dramatic improvements noted, in fact, by the president um, just a few months ago is our lightning mapper, a relatively new capability. But now that we've got higher and higher resolution for detecting lightning, we can, uh, to a certain extent, predict where the storm, where the fires are going to uh, initiate. Then, of course, comes the human element where our incident meteorologists are on scene with the firefighters. Uh, we need to continue training those incident meteorologists. A lot of people believe forecasts are mechanical, they're done by machines, they're done by computers, and it's spit out. It's actually the people that make the difference. And the last part of our responsibility is in the, if you will, the, uh, the effects of the fire, the smoke. We have uh, new products that we're developing that will allow high resolution, accurate forecasts of where the smoke is going to go. Um, you had um, asked about the research component. We are excited about a fiscal year 2022 element that we've got to establish a fire weather test bed. Uh, so it'll be a $15 million investment to conduct the kind of research you're talking about, but also operationalize it for those incident meteorologists. And the last comment I'll make is this is at the highest level of concern uh, at the White House and the administration, which is why we have the interagency working group uh, on fire that's uh, looking at the best processes to develop for research and operations to mitigate and protect the public from these, uh, what are gonna be an increased frequency and intensity of these events in the future. Thank you very much for that um, insight. I'm wondering, in addition to the high level interagency uh, work, what capacity do you have to um, work with other actors, for example, you know, in the state of California, we have OES and we have, and Oregon does as well. And even private sector individuals are getting involved. Do you have the legal authority? Do you have the resources to do all of that? And what's the status? It, we do have a lot of authorities. We have a lot of capability. In fact, in the, in the uh, president's summit on fire uh, back a couple of months ago, I made the personal commitment to the governors that if they need embedded Fire meteorologists, we're ready to provide that. We also uh, have people uh, embedded in the um, interagency fire center up in Boise. So we do have that capability to work there. It, there are no constraints with respect to our work with the private sector. Uh, and and I, I would say engagement has not been an issue for us with respect to fire. I thank you so very much. Unfortunately, we used to have a fire season. It's now virtually year round. Uh, because of climate change. And not only does it affect, you know, California and the, and the wildlife and the loss of uh, property and the like, but the smoke comes all the way to the East Coast. So it's, it's an issue for the whole country. And I thank you for your information. I yield back. Was our last member. Um, so before bringing the hearing to a close, I want to thank the administrator for testifying before our committee today. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. The witness is excused and the hearing is now adjourned. Thank you so much.